Bill Gates, thank you for talking again to Bloomberg. You've just announced this big initiative, 83 million as I calculate it, 33 from you, I think, and also from the um, Inter-American um, Development Bank and from Carlos Slim to deal with malaria in Central America and the Dominican Republic. Most of us thought that was a problem under control. Why do we need to do it? Well, of course, malaria was once a global phenomena. It was everywhere. Uh, Europe had terrible malaria. The U.S. did. Uh, what we've done over the last uh, 15 years is we've cut the cases by over 60%. And so we want to do two things now. We want to keep that case count going down, which is still mostly Africa, but we also want to shrink the map. Uh, if we shrink the map, it means the chance of, of uh, drug resistance uh, coming up is much lower. Uh, typically, drug resistance hasn't come out of uh, Africa, where you have the most cases. It's come out of uh, primarily Southeast Asia. So uh, every big health initiative in the world, like smallpox eradication, polio eradication, it started in the Americas. Uh, those things were proved to be feasible. And so in order to really learn how to do countrywide eradications, uh, this partnership uh, is, is very exciting. And it's based on what we learn with the success of this that we'll go in uh, over the next several decades and attack the heart of malaria, uh, which is in Central Africa. It's interesting, though, isn't it? I'm trying to think of all the times I've spoken to you where you have been coming and saying that we are, we are beginning to push back these diseases. But there was a WHO report which said malaria now, we're kind of stalling on that. It was something where we thought we were licking it, but actually there's 500,000 cases a year. I know only, I think, 40,000 in the area you're looking at now. But 500,000 cases a year, and it's so stubborn, it's not going away. And is that because of a failure of sort of technology or governments or what? Well, there's a tendency uh, for several things to happen unless you stay committed to these things. One is that you get drug resistance, either the insecticide on the bed nets, uh, and we have drug resistance to that now, so we... Uh, are working with the private sector to get innovation there. Uh, the drugs themselves, uh, we use these artemisinin combinations. In Southeast Asia, we have resistance there. And then just the energy people put into these programs. One of the great ironies is that as you uh, get malaria cases down, then a government will tend to move on and focus on something else, and so you'll see a rebound. So the last three years, because a lot of the bed nets have been wearing out, we haven't refreshed them as quick as we should, the last three years, we actually have had uh, the number of cases stay yes. flat. And in a few countries, including Nigeria, the cases have gone up. You always have a little bit of a, some variation in terms of the weather. The wet season is when the mosquitoes uh, peripherate in an exponential way. Uh, but the community needs to get its act together. And having uh, showpiece things where we really learn, like this Central America thing, is a key part of that. And is it, the, is it the pharmaceutical companies which are failing on the bed nets? I mean, there seems to be something to do with if, if resistance is growing, you, you know this as well as I do, that normally what happens is drug companies go off and come up with new ways to get around that. And there seems to be enough failure this time. Yeah, the uh, chemical ingredients we use on the bed nets or for the sprain come to us from the agricultural chemical companies. So yes, Bayer, Bassa, Mitsui, Sumitomo. Uh, I'm meeting here with all of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've seen that the approval process has been really too long and pretty imprecise, and so we're working with uh, the WHO on that and really encouraging these companies to stay engaged, although for them it's a very tiny market. Uh, it's something they will do uh, partly because of their social responsibility. But is there a market failure there? Um, well, anytime somebody without much money needs a life-saving drug, you don't have that signal of, oh, please make it because you'll, uh, you'll profit from it. Malaria is overwhelmingly in very, very poor places. And so, in general, we've got to have government and philanthropy play some type of role to get this one licked. And the governments also seem to be pulling back a little bit. I just looked and saw Trump um, in his budget wants to reduce funding from malaria by 13%. Does that seem a wise move to you? Well, certainly I'm, uh, you know, I think we should increase it by uh, even more than that. Uh, on budget matters, the final say in the U.S. is from the Congress. Yes. And so I'd say I'm quite optimistic we won't see a cut. The uh, members of Congress who think about pandemics, who think about America's reputation in Africa and stability in Africa, uh, so far they've been willing to keep these aid budgets uh, completely intact. 
uh, and we're going to do our best to make sure they, they keep doing that. Are you really confident that, that, that this particular Congress and this particular presidency really, really are think about America's reputation in Africa? Well, the, there is a danger that if you, if you think America first too much, then the long-term benefit of African stability and goodwill in Africa, it just in absolute or even relative to uh, competitors like China, you would tend to devalue that. Uh, and you know, so there needs to be a debate about was this caring about Africa, you know, some sort of pure elitist thing that, that didn't serve American needs, or was it really very enlightened that even from a pure American point of view, uh, this was beneficial? And, you know, I'm a strong proponent of the latter. And uh, what, Is there any element in Africa, you've, you've talked movingly about this before, you have a vast number of people die, you have all the walking wounded, you also get hit by malaria generally. Is there any element where people turn to China now and say, look, you should be the people stepping forward to help do this, not just America? Well, the, the idea of countries competing to be the best at inventing new drugs or helping out poor countries the most, that's a, a positive sum competition. Yes. Uh, you know, as long as it doesn't come with a price that, okay, and you'll do something corrupt with us. Uh, you know, in the U.S., it has been good about with our uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and things, we haven't tied our aid into things that tend to, uh, would be negative for the country. China's getting more enlightened about that all the time, uh, you know, and so hopefully they'll reach out in, the China, in parallel. The, China, the old argument between us, but do you think the Chinese are really, they're really this time looking at doing works which are kind of pro bono as opposed to building things where there's a much more straightforward commercial advantage to them? I think, I think as they, as they're becoming richer, as they're seeing a strong role in the world. Uh, you know, China has a conference with the African leaders on a, a regular basis called FOCAC that uh, I'll attend later this year. Compared to the, the U.S. in history and today, you know, Chinese aid is, is very, very small. And the African countries appreciate, you know, particularly in HIV and malaria, where under President Bush, the U.S. made these big increases. They, they've totally appreciate that we've done that and I think we re really can afford to keep doing it. It's a very small part of the budget and I don't think going to them and saying, hey, we need to increase AIDS or malaria deaths uh, because we're so short of what something uh, really is the best there's, idea. There's obviously a social good there, but there's also this question of soft power, whether America now is prepared to commit itself to those things. Is that something that you worry about, especially with the current administration? Yeah, the balance of hard power versus soft power, you know, the U.S. uniquely has the ratio of emphasizing hard power, and I'd hate to see it shift even further, and, and it's part of these budget discussions, the question of do you grow the State Department at the same time you're growing the pure defense budget? Uh, even the Secretary of Defense has been eloquent that you don't want to mm. give up your soft power tools, and, uh, you know, it's all, all being debated. You follow a lot of history. This, is this, isn't this arguably the first case of a global hegemon sort of willingly giving away that hegemonic power by not investing in soft power? Normally what happens is the hegemon gets pushed out and all this soft power goes too. In this case, America is actually pulling back from helping the rest of the world, surely. Well, this, I wouldn't uh, say it's unique. The, the U.S. has often had this debate you know, our relationship with the United Nations has had its yes, ups and true. downs under different administrations. And, you know, uh, you know uh, keeping some pressure on the UN to be efficient and reasonable is not a, not a crazy yes. thing. You know, how far do you go? Uh, you know, it's all to do with the specifics. In the case of, of uh, health, the lives are being saved for very small amounts of money. And you can aim to both lift the country up so it's self-sufficient and get rid of the disease. And so it's not a, a commitment that you're stuck with forever. Uh, so I think these ones, even in this atmosphere, make, make the cut. Do you think George W. Bush, in a strange way, never got the credit he deserved for trying to save lives in Africa in the way he did? No, he didn't because uh, you know, Africa is, is less visible. Uh, not as many people go there. Uh, it, his PEPFAR initiative, uh, which was uh, HIV focused and his president initiative. Those were fantastic things, and I do think, in some circles, he does get credit for those things, uh, but not probably not as much as he deserves. 
Um, one, one last thing, you know, President Trump, famously all these countries, he's described them in a not terribly nice phrase. Um, it, do you think he should concentrate more on the poor of the world? Well, I think he should. Uh, you know, that's the area where I've chosen you, to take uh, the wealth that uh, was created through Microsoft and that Warren Buffett has been so generous uh, in providing. And so, you know, I understand that that money can be very, very well spent. And so, uh, you know, I'm in there saying, come on, let's, let's keep up the good work. Bill Gates, thank you very, very much for talking to Bloomberg. Thank you.